All right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. It's your buddy CJ here. And tonight, we're going car shopping on Facebook Marketplace. Are you kidding me? Come on. We're going to have a blast. Guys, welcome back. You know, I appreciate and love each and every one of my subscribers. Thank you for being a part of the channel. If you're new, give me a like and subscribe. Leave me those comments around here. We talk about cars. We talk about the automotive industry. We talk about all the things that real automotive enthusiasts are interested in. Automotive events, automotive manufacturers, cars, 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 real gearhead talk. People, you know it and I know it. This is the place to be for that real gearhead talk. Welcome back, everybody. Let's go ahead and get right into this. Listen, it's Saturday night in September and there's a bunch of guys right now who are watching college football. You know, and maybe their teams are losing and they're not doing real well. Not us. We're winning tonight, guys. We having fun because we're looking at cars. So if your college football team is not doing well so far, hang out with your buddy CJ. I'm going to get you lined up with the right car. As an automotive enthusiast, you're going to be part of the club. And you're going to just take your fall season to the next level, regardless of how your college football team is doing. Come on. We having fun tonight. Let's get right into it. Tonight, guys, uh, what I've done is I've picked a few listings right off of Facebook Marketplace. I have not studied the listings. I just very quickly identified a few that looked interesting to me. And I want to come on here. I want to talk to you about them. And uh, listen, this is what we do, isn't it? We look at Auto Trader. And we look at Bring a Trailer and eBay Motors and Facebook Marketplace. The thing I like about Facebook Marketplace, it gets wild out there. They be wilding on Facebook Marketplace. Like, you never know what you're going to find on Facebook Marketplace. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're going to look at some of that tonight and have a bit of fun. My intention is not to throw shade or hate on anyone's car or their listing. Heck, if anything, I'd like to help promote these listings. These listings are live right now on Facebook Marketplace, you know, Saturday, September 7th, 2024. So if you're interested in any of these cars, go out there and find them. I'm just going to tell you what I think. I'm always in the market for cars. I'm like you. I'm always looking. Uh, and I like talking about cars, and I know you do too. So come on, let's go ahead and get right into it. Those are the only rules. I pick listings kind of at random, things that look interesting to me. I don't study them. Then I come on here and uh, you guys know how we do it around here. We just talk about it. So leave me those comments as we're going along. But listen, guys, let's look at the first one here together. Guys, what are we talking about here? Pontiac Fiero GT, 1988. Uh, this fellow is in Memphis, Indiana. Who knew there was a Memphis, Indiana? Uh, this listing is live on Facebook Marketplace right now. 88 Pontiac Fiero GT, which was a premium trim model. This was the last year of the Fiero. They ran from 1984 to 1988, I believe. This car was a bit controversial, I'd say, in hindsight, and maybe viewed overall unfavorably and not as a success. You know, I think it was a bit of a technology revolution when it came out as sort of an economy two-seater for Pontiac with moderate to mild performance. But the way I always looked at it was, especially with the, the later model GTs like this 1988, kind of a mini Trans Am, which was kind of cool. It was like a baby Trans Am, mid-engine, engine out back, but certainly nowhere near the performance of the street cred or the presence of like a Pontiac Firebird or, or Trans Am. Guys, this one's kind of interesting because it's got 34,000 miles on it. He's asking 17,500 uh, bucks. As you can see, it looks like, listen, it looks like it's, a, it's in great shape. I'm looking at the stance of this car. You guys tell me what you think. This does not look like the factory stance for this car. I don't know if he's modded the suspension or what. I don't think I see anything in the listing on the suspension, but doesn't it look like it's almost got a reverse rake to it? Um, I don't know what's going on there. If he's, you know, uh, done something with the shocks or air shocks or something ride height. Anyway, does not look like the factory ride height. I'm not an expert. That's just my reaction. I like the look of those BF Goodridge radial TAs. 
listen, they made this, the 88 Fiero GT, I believe they also made in like a gold and black. That was a sharp looking car. Uh, leave me those comments if you remember that one. I used to see those around town back in the day, and I just thought they were super sharp. As I said, the Fiero is a car that got better. Here he is in Indiana, and clearly this is a show car. My question is, and I guess my issue with this car and with this listing, if I had a budget of, let's say, fifteen dollars to $18,000 to get into this hobby, and I wanted to get something unique and a bit collectible but not over-the-top expensive, would I go with a Fiero, I guess is the question, knowing that you can probably snag like a similar era generation of a, you know, a third gen or a fourth gen Camaro Z28, something like that. IROCs are going up in price, but something in that realm, a Firebird Formula 350 uh, or even a Trans Am, you know, there's a lot of cars in this price bracket from this era, you know, would I go with a Fiero? And I guess the answer is, personally for me, probably not. Although whenever I see these at shows, I always stop and look. They're just really interesting cars. They are just super interesting and indicative of the era, that rad era. You don't see many Fieros. Not a lot survived. Listen, the 1984s, I think they had internal engine problems, connecting rods or whatever, uh, leading to fires, engine failures that caused oil leaks that ultimately led to fires. That's my understanding. I do think that ultimately Pontiac General Motors fixed those issues, but it was too late. The damage was done. So back in the 80s, if there is such a thing, a 1980s meme was the Fiero catching on fire, uh, even though we didn't have memes in the 80s. But uh, in all seriousness, there's a look at that mid-engine uh, that engine bay, check that out. I mean, this guy's got all the paperwork. Look at that, that you could want. So a lot of people will see this car at a car show or car meet and not know what it is. So if you're a guy or a gal in this hobby who wants to be unique and have something that nobody else has, Fiero could be an interesting buy. Look how rad that dash is, man. That's just, that's the 80s right there. You were looking at the 80s in this dashboard. It's just unbelievable. Uh, it's great to see one of these that truly did survive. Um, see, that's a good look. See, the stance looks about right there in that photo. I don't know. It looks a little unusual in this photo. Could be the way the car is sitting. But what do you guys think? 1988 Pontiac Fiero GT. I claim uh, an interesting car out there on Facebook Marketplace right now. Probably not something I would buy. But for the automotive enthusiast who wants something unusual, something rad era, this could be an interesting buy. Really, really kind of interesting. All right, guys. Let's keep going. What do you think? Are we having fun tonight? I think we are. And let's keep shopping on Facebook Marketplace, shall we? <clears throat> what do we have next? Facebook Marketplace, car shopping with your buddy, CJ. What are we looking at here? Are you kidding me? 1994 Ferrari, 348 Spider in red with a black top, tan interior, gated manual five-speed, 34,000 miles. He says the clutch has about 70% life on it, $75,000. Guys, what do you think? 1994 Ferrari 348. Let me tell you something. Look at the styling. If this isn't rad, I don't know what is. Look at the side strakes. The one thing I always liked about the 348s are those side strakes. This is kind of an unusual, controversial uh, Ferrari. You know, I, I think there are a lot of folks who don't have a lot of love for the 348s. I actually think they're really cool. Uh, look at the pop-up headlights. Uh, look at the wheels. You know, um, I kind of like the Spider. You put that top down. This is a great cruiser. You've got the five-speed gated manual Ferrari. What more could you want? Uh, I mean, you know, look at the dash. Perhaps nothing fancy there by, by today's standards. But you got your basics. You got your tack. Uh, you got, uh, temperature, you got oil pressure, um, listen, and, and your speed up to, is that 200 miles an hour? Yeah, right. <laughs> Not in your 348, but anyway, uh, guys, let's keep going. Uh, what do you think here? That gated manual is probably one of the coolest things about this car. Uh, look at the interior still, you know, I I'd say that leather still looks good. Uh, those seats just look comfortable, don't they? Um, I got to say, those are those are fulsome seats as I look at them. 
Uh, it still looks like a car I'd want to go for a drive in. You know, some of these cars from the 80s and 90s, they have not held up well. You know, if I, I always think about like a third gen Camaro or a fourth generation Corvette. I'm not hating on Chevy, obviously, but, you know, those cars, especially the early ones, those interiors did not hold up real well. General Motors, a lot of the Chrysler stuff was the same way. This Ferrari, I mean, look at that interior. I don't know if it's been redone or not, but uh, looks like it has held up and those seats just look so super comfortable. Of course, you've got a frunk in this car. Now, look at the view from the rear end, you know, just so wide. It's got those louvers on the taillights. Come on, guys. Uh, what do you think? Is this a Ferrari you would consider for 75 grand? Is he firm? I don't know. Um, he says he's sorry. Uh, he, he, he doesn't want anyone wasting his time on these low ball offers. I understand, brother. Trust me. No leaks. Tons of thumbs up everywhere I go. This is one of those cars where you're going to get a lot of thumbs up. I believe this guy. Where is he out of? He's out of Rio Verde, Arizona. And as of today, September 7th, 2024, this car is still available. He says he's got a new AC pump and filter dryer, uh, new front and rear brake pads, new e-brake, and new battery. So, you know, I'm going to say something that is probably common knowledge. Here's a little video the guy made. Pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to say something that's probably common knowledge, which is that when you buy a Ferrari like this, 1980s, 1990s Ferrari, you got to be concerned about maintenance or at least aware. Eyes wide open. Whoa, I hit my microphone. Eyes wide open when you buy a car, an exotic car like a Ferrari from this era. Is the engine going to have to come out for certain maintenance? What about belts? What about clutch? Okay. What about electronics issues from this era? Wiring issues. Listen, I don't know. I've never owned a Ferrari from this vintage, from this era, but this is the type of thing you'll have to do your homework on. And, you know, I always say when you buy a car like this, don't rule it out necessarily if you know there's some risk with maintenance costs, but make sure that you keep your reserves, knowing that if I buy this car for 75K, Knowing it's an old Ferrari, one, I'm going to have to find someone to work on it. And then if something breaks or something goes wrong, that could be a five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 nut, okay? Uh, these can be expensive issues, something with the top, an electrical problem, a drivetrain problem, engine failure. You know, these are things you have to think about. But as long as you take all of that into consideration, and as I said, you go in eyes wide open, you'll be Okay. Uh, but, but definitely be aware of those things. You know, I don't know if it's just the photo or if I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing, but it doesn't, it looks like the paint could use a correction. That could just be the way that the light's reflecting. Uh, in other words, it doesn't look like perfect paint. I mean, the car, listen, car is what, 30 years old now. Uh, so nowhere in here doesn't say it's a perfect show car by any stretch, but, uh, just my you know, as much as I can tell from photos, I think you one of the things you might want to do with a car like this is have the paint corrected, polished, ceramic coated, all those things. It's just a heck of a throwback. Look, one way to look at it is $75,000 or so, and you've got a Ferrari. And you will be the only person in your town with a Ferrari uh, 348, guaranteed. Go to any cars and coffee in your town and pull in. You're not going to see another Ferrari 348. If you do, it'll be a rarity. You know, unless you're in certain towns in California, maybe. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, an incredibly interesting, cool, vintage, exotic car. $75,000 right now on Facebook Marketplace. Guys, what do you think? Let's keep going. Are we having fun tonight? Yes, we are. Leave me those comments. Let me know what you guys think. I like doing this with you guys every once in a while. Just uh, kind of doing some Facebook Marketplace shopping. And let's keep going, guys. What are we looking at here? Guys, Ford Taurus SHO. Who knows what the Ford Taurus SHO is? In the mid to late 80s, the Ford Taurus was anything but a cool car. The Ford Taurus was like, oops. Let's go back in here. The Ford Taurus was basically, you know, your grandfather's car in a sedan form. Or, you know, in the station wagon form, this car was like, you know, the, the ultimate family car. I mean, there was nothing cool or performance oriented about a Ford Taurus. 
This was basic transportation. This was regular traffic in the 80s. So what I like about the Ford Taurus SHO is that it's a true sleeper in a true factory hot rod in every sense of the word. What they did was they took this nondescript, you know, average family car, the official car of like the middle-aged guy commuting to work, the Ford Taurus in the 80s, and they put a hot engine in it, hot drivetrain, some aggressive styling cues, and they came up with what I consider to be one of the ultimate sleepers from the 80s. You could argue about the Grand National and some of those other cars. You know, Grand National was really extreme. This car uh, was another one which was just really unique. And I claim has some serious street cred even today. First generation Ford Taurus SHO sedan. These had a V6 produced by Yamaha. Did you know that? How many car guys know about the Yamaha derived engine in the first generation Ford Taurus SHO? Car guys, if you don't know about the first gen SHO, you need to learn about it. Uh, I remember when these came out, we would look for them. You could tell if you could see in that rear bumper, it's got uh, it, it. It doesn't have you know badges or anything that really stand out. It's very subtle. It had on that rear bumper uh, an, an impression of S H O, the letters S H O, uh, as well as on the wheels on the on the wheel covers. Very subtle badging here. You you, you see, there's a spoiler, but you know it was also sort of unique colors as I remember it from the factory that indicated it was an SHO in addition to the dual exhaust. So there were certain styling cues that you could pick up on to say, oh, wait a minute, that's not a regular Ford Taurus. No, this was the Ford Taurus SHO. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, they were available in a manual. I don't know if all of them were manuals. I seem to remember something that maybe it was the first year, the first couple of years with that Yamaha high-performance engine dual overhead cam and whatever the heck else it had. Uh, I don't remember all the details. I think it may have had like 24 valves or something. But um, what I will tell you is I want to say that they were available solely in manual at first and then maybe eventually in auto. Um, but these were, you know, high performance factory hot rods of the era. If you think about like a Dodge Charger SRT, you know, uh, uh, in the current era, or even a Dodge Charger RT, you say, wow, you know, it's a family sedan, but it's kind of hot rodded in a way. It's got some, some decent performance. That's what the Taurus was in the late 80s. The Taurus SHO anyway. And, you know, again, this guy wants 12,000 bucks. This one's out there in San Jose, California area. He says he's got a three uh, clean title, 3.2 liter V6, about 72,000 miles. He's talking about uh, some work he's had done. Apparently, he's got a big, yeah, I can see the subwoofer in the back seat. Not sure I'd want that. But, uh, you know, listen, it, it's a modest price. You know, uh, again, would I want a Ford Taurus SHO? I would if I was looking to get into sort of the rad era, something unusual, not like every other Trans Am or Corvette or Mustang from that era, something a little bit different. If you could find a low mileage, non-molested, if you will, uh, late 80s, early 90s, Ford Taurus SHO sedan, you will have a real sleeper that legit automotive enthusiasts will know about. A lot of people will look at it and not even know what it is and maybe won't even notice it. It's kind of under the radar. It was under the radar in the late 80s, early 90s, and it's still under the radar. It's just an unusual car. But it is, in my view, this has evolved into an enthusiast car because, you know, you've got the Chevy Impalas of that era. Uh, you know, if I, if I think about other factory sleepers, there were a few. And then, you know, the performance cars of the era, you know, the Dodge Daytona Shelbys, obviously the Camaros, the Mustangs, all that stuff. This car flies under the radar. Uh, there weren't as many of them and they were a true sleeper. Factory hot rod sedan, the Ford Taurus SHO. What do you guys think? Guys, let's keep going. Are we having fun tonight? Yes, we're doing a little Facebook marketplace car shopping with your buddy CJ. By the way, what do you think about the new red shirts? 
Uh, if you want one of these shirts, you got to hit me up, direct message me on Instagram. I will send you a free shirt. I'm not selling them. These are for you guys because I love you and I care about you. And I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. While supplies last, if you hit me up on the gram, I will send you guys a free shirt. Hey, listen, we got to stick together. Gearheads got to stick together. Come on, let's keep going. I want to look at a couple more cars with you. Guys, I want to throw uh, something at you that maybe you didn't expect. Facebook car shopping tonight. Listen, I want to look at this Tesla model plaid. Why do I want to look at a plaid with you? Guys, I think it's interesting to look at a plaid because I was thinking about this the other day. This happens to be a 2021 Tesla Model S plaid. He wants 61900 for it, uh, which sounds like a lot to me. I know that when these first came out, these were like ninety dollars to $100,000 cars. But, you know, prices have dropped a lot. This one's like three years old. It's only got less than 10,000 miles on it. Where is this car? This car is in Henrico, Virginia. Uh, listen, looks looks clean. Uh, it's still under warranty. Uh, he's got the full self-driving package if you're into that. Heated and cooled seats, 21-inch uh, arachnid wheels, so on and so forth. Battery warranty through August of 2029. So if you want a Plaid, a Model S Plaid, this might be one to consider. But I do think it's interesting you know, when, when the plaids first came out, the Model S plaids, there was so much talk about the 0 to 60 time, 1.8 seconds or whatever it is. Definitely sub two seconds, right? Uh, and all the footage on YouTube and stuff, uh, the drag racing, they're smoking all the supercars with the plaid. But I think the interesting thing since 2020 till now with the Tesla Model S plaids and the Model X plaids, the car community has spoken. Car culture has spoken, and I think in a resounding, unified voice, we don't care. Most automotive enthusiasts don't care that certain electric cars are ridiculously fast, zero to 60, maybe even zero to 100. You know, this hyper acceleration. Um, car guys are just not there. I, I do think that there's an element of our hobby that maybe, you know, has taken a shine to some of these cars and have experimented with them. And, you know, they enjoy going to the eighth mile and the quarter mile and the drag strip and smoking all the muscle cars and the, the Corvettes and the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the McLarens and everything with their Tesla Model S plaids or their Lucids or whatever. But uh, when was the last time you heard someone talking about it? Hey, I really want a Tesla Model S in the car community. You don't. Uh, you know, have the plaids displaced the Hellcats? No, they haven't. Guys who are into big, heavy V8s and supercharged engines, twin turbo internal combustion engines, or just large displacement uh, Mopars or Camaros or Corvettes or supercars. Tesla has not won over many of those people, in my observation. There's a segment of the car buying population in the United States and beyond who are into these cars. But I'm talking about the automotive enthusiast. I claim Tesla hasn't really made a dent yet. In fact, there's probably been some backlash in the past 36 months with the sort of, you know, a slowdown generally in EVs, some backlash with, you know, some not so great press on things like the Cybertruck, but specifically with the Model S, you know, it's an aging platform. This car has been around for quite some time. Uh, the Model S Plaid, kind of a, you know, in some ways a one-trick pony. I mean, this looks like a nice car. And I'm sure if you, if you want to get into EV and you want some hyper acceleration performance, it's probably a, a very fun car, an interesting car to own. But, uh, you know, automotive enthusiasts in mass have not flocked to this just because it's a fast accelerating car. Now, what I will tell you is I seriously contemplated getting a Model S this past year. I didn't buy one. Uh, but as I looked at it, I was looking at uh, Model S's other than plaids. I wanted the range. Range was more important to me than just ridiculous acceleration zero to 60. Listen, they all have ridiculous acceleration zero to 60. 
Uh, if I was going to get a Model S, I was going to get one with optimized range and something still under warranty. I'm doing some road trips and stuff, and I thought it would be a fun experiment. Uh, I would not go for this car only because if I was going EV, and you could see it's got the yoke. What do you guys think about the yoke? Leave me those comments. I have not driven a Tesla with the yoke. I've only driven a Tesla with a regular steering wheel. Um, you know, I wanted to really optimize range. And with the plaid, while you get the ridiculous face melting performance and acceleration and some of the little uh, aggressive styling cues, you do not get the optimized range that you can get from other versions of the Model S. And I'm not an expert on all things Model S, but like the dual motor, long range, whatever. The, the newer ones have the better batteries. Uh, this one is is newer. Uh, you know, it's got the better um, infotainment as a 2021. I believe it was around, don't quote me, 2019, 2020, when they started using the, uh, the better infotainment, the bigger and better infotainment. So listen, if you wanted a plaid, this might be one to get still under warranty. Um, but for me, uh, definitely not the car. And if I was buying a Tesla, I would not go plaid. I would go with a Model S, goosed out with all the options, but optimized for range. So guys, let's keep going. I got one more for you. Um, I'm going to pull up my last Facebook marketplace. So check this out. 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix, 10,500 original miles. Guy wants 15,000 bucks for it. This is an interesting old muscle car. It's got the 400 cubic inch Pontiac engine. Uh, you know, some might say this is when we started to get into that malaise era with emissions where you had these large displacement engines with not a heck of a lot of horsepower and performance. And I think this car, I don't have the specs on it. Uh, this is out in California also. Uh, I don't have the specs on it. This car would fall into that category. Like you are not going to get, you know, that throw you back in the seat, high performance out of this car. Emissions probably kind of killed the performance in this car. You can wake it up. I mean, it's 1975. You can probably do some bolt-ons and wake it up and, 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 and bring it around. But then again, for a car with only 10,000 miles on it since 1975, maybe you want to keep it as a cruiser and driver. You can see indicative of the era. It's got these... Uh, these these bumper pads, these bumper bra brackets that uh, you just don't see anymore. That was uh, part of regulation back in the day. You can see the two-tone paint. I do like these wheels, these Pontiac wheels from that era. Look at the interior. Can we all just agree that Pontiac, in terms of 1970s and 1980s General Motors cars, guys, hard to argue, Pontiac had some of the best interiors, even into the 90s for, from, for General Motors cars. I, I think they... They captured that sporty element uh, with a bit of luxury, kind of a luxury sport type vibe with the Pontiacs. And here in the Grand Prix, you're definitely seeing that. It's a two-door car. Those seats, those front seats fold forward, and you got that huge bench seat in the back. Look at how plush those seats are, that velour, uh, that, that fabric. Uh, you know, I'm sure this thing rides like a cloud. Look at all the round gauges on the dash. Uh, and the air vents uh, for the heating and AC. Big old door. This is the adjustment for the mirror. You got those old General Motors door locks. You got the power windows. It's just body by Fisher. You can see it's body by Fisher. You don't see that anymore in any cars. Guys who know your muscle cars know what I'm talking about. But uh, guys, this car is interesting because, A, you don't see many 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix. You'll see a lot of Chevelles, Impalas. Oldsmobile Cutlass, GTOs. How many 75 Grand Prix do you see? Not too many. Not many survived. A lot of these ended up in the scrapyard. And uh, it's not a super desirable car. Look, look at the turn signals on the dash. Look at those big old gauges. You got a cigarette lighter. Okay. You just things you just don't have. Look at the gigantic clock on the dash, the old General Motors keys. It's just a throwback to another era. And you know, listen, if I had a $15,000 budget to get into this hobby and I wanted something from the muscle car era, but something unusual, something with a bit of luxury and you could cruise in and nobody's going to have a car like this, that would be this car. 
However, if you're more performance minded, I would tend to say this is not the car for you. Uh, as you can see, uh, look under that hood. I mean, in order to wake this car up, you're, 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 you're going to need to do a bit. And the good news is it's not a, a hard car to work on. Uh, you know, whether you chose to swap the engine out or, or build up on that uh, Pontiac 400, you can probably do some things to at least wake it up, get it some nice exhaust tone. Look at the big old headlights on that and that hood, that massive hood. Look at that. Like there's nothing on the road that looks like that today. It's just silly, right? Uh, and, it, and it's kind of retro cool, but you got to be into that 70s era. It's not a 60s car with some of those classic, you know, the best of the muscle car era. And it's not early 70s. It's like mid 70s. So, you know, this car is not for everybody. But interesting in that it's a survivor with low mileage. And there certainly aren't a lot of them. Would I spend 15 grand on it? Probably not the right car for me. But again, thought I'd come on here and talk about it uh, just because I think it's a real interesting and unusual survivor. So guys, that's about it for tonight's episode. I wanted to come on here. Your buddy CJ wanted to do some Facebook Marketplace car shopping with you on a Saturday night. Why? Because that's what we do. We look at cars. Guys, what did you think? Uh, do you agree with my observations? Anything there you're interested in? Uh, leave me those comments. Give me a like and subscribe. Guys, listen, follow me on the Instagram. Uh, send me those instant messages with suggestions for episodes and just anything you want to ask or talk about. It's a lot of you have reached out and we talk about cars and you ask me questions and I'm just having a blast getting to know many of you and interacting with you and just watching the channel continue to grow. It's just been an absolute blast and it's a real joy and it's really taken my enjoyment of the automotive hobby to the next level. So I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I can't wait to see what's next as we continue to, to build and grow the community. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the road at local events and national events in the coming months and right into uh, 2025 as we roll into the fourth quarter of 2024 here. So guys, anyway, listen, enough out of me for tonight. Have a good one. And uh, until I see you on the next one, peace.